Okay, so today we're going to learn about polarimetry. We're going to use polarimetry to measure a specific rotation and as well we're going to make a standard curve and we're going to use that to measure concentrations of sugar. So if we're going to do that, the first thing we've got to do is make up some standard solutions. And you can see me working away here extra fast and what I'm doing is the first thing, I've weighed out exactly 10 grams of sugar and once I've done that, I'm going to quantitatively transfer it into a volumetric flask, making sure to make that it, all the material gets into the volumetric flask, none of it spilled, wash everything down, properly dissolved, and then the very last thing I do is I make it up to the line. Once I've made it up to the line, and it's important to be patient here, because if you get it wrong, you've got to start again, get it up to the line, put a lid in, and make sure it's homogenous. Once we've done that, the next thing to do is to make our different dilutions. So in order to do that, the first thing we've got to do is take some of our stock solution and put it into a beaker. It's very important that we don't pipette out of the volumetric flask with the stock solution in it, because if we do, we'll probably contaminate it, and then all of our solutions will be out. The next thing you'll notice that I do, and I'm doing this at very high speed, um, is that I'm washing each pipette as I use it. Notice that I'm safely inserting the pipette while holding it near to the pipette filler, and then when I want to let the solution back out again, I can take the pipette filler off the top and allow it to drain. Each pipette is rinsed out with the sugar solution before you pipette into your volumetric flask with the appropriate amount. So into each of these I've prepared 5, 10, 15, 20 and 25 milliliters and I'm going to make them all up to 50 milliliters. And you can see I'm very patiently making each one up to the line, working drop by drop, drop by drop by drop. And this is speeded up about 16 times, that's why it happens so quickly. Put in all the stoppers, invert them all and make sure they're homogenous. And now we're on to making our measurements. So this is the polarimeter and inside the polarimeter is a cell. The cell is a tube with an open end at either side and to, the first thing that we want to do is we want to clean it out. So you can put in water in one end and it'll come out the other end. And you have to be a little bit careful when you're pouring or pouring stuff into it because if you overfill it, it'll go in one end and out the other and it'll make a mess. You can see me here cleaning it out with deionized water. Uh, maybe two or three times if it's not been used for a while and it's dirty however many times you need to. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fill the cell with deionized water and we're going to use that to take a zero reading or to blank the machine. So to blank the machine, it's a little different for each machine. They're not all exactly the same. Some of them have a big red button on the side. This one has a touch screen and so if you push the button that, or the area of the screen that says zero when the machine is filled with distilled water and then say yes, the machine will now read zero. Another thing you have to be careful of when you're filling your cell is that there are no bubbles inside. So if there's no bubbles inside your cell, when you look through it, it should look like this. You can see from one end to the other, there's two quartz windows on either end of the cell. On the other hand, if you don't have your cell completely full and you have a bubble in the way, you'll see what happens now. Now for the effect, I've just emptied the cell entirely, but the same thing will happen if you have a bubble. The machine will start to say, sample too dark, and you can see that flashing in black writing over the black background on the screen and you'll have a bubble and it'll look something like that and you won't be able to see the light coming through and so the machine won't be able to make an accurate reading. If you have that, all you have to do is rock the cell gently from left to right, back and forth a few times until you see the bubble come out. So what we're going to do now is we're going to make measurements for each of our different standards. Before we do that, it's very important that we clean the cell out between each reading. If we don't clean the cell out between each reading, our readings will be off, sometimes substantially. I'll show you an example of this when I'm going through where I don't wash the cell out and you can see my reading is off by more than 10%. The thing you'll notice there is that I'm filling the cell from a beaker rather than filling it directly from the volumetric flask. This is actually just a practical convenience because some volumetric flasks have very narrow necks and it's almost impossible to fill them without spilling it everywhere. You want to take the cell out of the machine before you fill it. I know I'm doing it all on screen here, but when you're filling it, you should take the cell out of the machine so that you don't spill material inside the polarimeter because it'll cause it to rust. You can see the hinges there are already starting to suffer the effects. The less this happens, the better. So now what we do is we fill the cell, make the measurement, take it back out again, empty again, wash the cell, wash it with the new solution it's gonna contain, make the measurement and put it back in again. And you'll see this time, what I do is I don't wash the cell in between and I get a reading of about 6.9. Now if I take the same material and measure it again, having rinsed the cell out, you'll see that it's all the way up at 7.4. So it's quite a substantial difference and it can really throw your results off. Make sure you wash the cell out with the solution it's gonna contain each time. Now again, working at high speed, 
We we'll just go through each of the different samples and when you were doing this in the lab, you'd be recording each of the results so that later we can put it into a standard curve and make it uh, make determinations of concentrations for unknown samples. The very last one that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure the rotation of the 10 grams per 100 milliliters that I made up in the first place. Okay, now let's try and figure out what was going on inside the machine. So to demonstrate the effect outside the machine, what I have is I have a helium neon laser, which is polarized. This means that all of the waves of light are oscillating in the same direction. The other thing I have is a piece of polarized material. And as you can see, when I rotate it, in some, at some angles, when the polarization of the light and the polarization of the piece of material are at 90 degrees to each other, all of the light is absorbed. If I rotate it by 90 degrees, all of the light gets through a further 90 degrees and you can see all of the light is absorbed again. Now I'm going to take the cell from the polarimeter, which has a sugar solution in it. The sugar solution should rotate the plane of polarization since it is one enantiomer of a chiral molecule. So at 265 degrees, no light could get through. But now if we move the cell in the way and the light has to travel through the sugar solution, you can see that light is getting through. This is because the plane of polarization has turned and so the polaroid film is not lined up exactly to cut out all the light. You can see if we rotate it, we can find an angle where the light is going to be cut. So the light is still polarized, it has just changed the angle of its polarization. So if we find this angle now and we measure it, we can see that if we take our initial angle from our final angle, we can get the difference. And this is our rotation. We can then put this into the formula for determining specific rotation and we can figure out what the specific rotation of this material is. And so if you do that maths, you get 110 degrees. And it's 110 degrees per gram per centimeter cubed per decimeter. So you've got to make sure you get your units right before you do that calculation. And you can see again, if I take it out of the way, the light makes it through the Polaroid again. The material we were measuring was maltose. And if you look up the specific rotation of maltose, you'll see that it's a little bit different. But this, of course, makes sense because the wavelength that we used was 633 nanometers and not the usual 589 nanometers. And also, compared to the machine, we were relatively inaccurate in our measurements since we were trying to line it up by hand and determine darkness by hand. The machine itself, on the other hand, is far more accurate in determining the alpha D and you can get several significant figures into your measurement. Okay, that's all for this video. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below or up on Moodle or ask in the lab. See you soon. Bye.